Hello, it's a great pleasure. Pleasure to be back in, in Berkeley area. You've written a very engaging and insightful book, The Road to Reality, A Complete Guide to the Laws of the Universe. Could you tell us a little bit about it and what motivated you in writing it? Yes, well, the book is uh, meant to describe what's going on in basic physics today and what led up to that in terms which are a bit more technical than the accounts that you normally get in, in popular books. So uh, it was an attempt to describe things at a deeper level than you, than you can usually get access to without, you know, without going to the full thing and reading a textbook. I should I perhaps explain the origin of the book, which might be of some interest to people. Some years ago, I wrote a book called The Emperor's New Mind, and that book was describing the point of view which I had about consciousness and why it was not something that comes about from complicated calculations. So we're not exactly computers, There's something else going on, and the question of what this something else was would depend on some detailed physics, was the idea. And so I needed to have chapters in that book which describes the physics as it's understood today. Well, anyway, th this book was written, and various people commented to me. They said, well, you know, I could perhaps use this book for a course, Physics for Poets, or whatever it is, if it didn't have all that contentious stuff about the mind in it. So I thought, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound too hard. All I do is I get my scissors out and snip out all the bits which have any something to do with the mind. The trouble is that uh, if I did that, and I didn't actually do it, but I sort of imagined doing it, the whole book fell to pieces, really, because the whole driving force behind the book was uh, this quest to find out, you know, what could it be that constitutes consciousness in, in the physical world as we know it or as we might hope to know it in the future. But um, <coughs> without that driving force, the book sort of didn't hang together, really. So I had to think of some other basis for this. You see, initially I thought of a book about half as long as the other, and the other one's about 400 hours. The search for the laws which govern the universe at its deepest level, that kind of thing. So that meant I had to include a lot of other things in the book and uh, a lot of mathematics because I wanted to explain it at the same sort of detail as I did in The Emperor's New Mind or maybe a bit more. And this required describing a lot of mathematical ideas in some, de well, not too much detail, but to give the gist, the basic feeling for what was really going on. And I made a list of all the different mathematical topics, and, it, and I was rather horrified to see how many there were. And it was even worse, in a sense, because when I wrote the book, I kept realizing there were topics I hadn't really covered and needed to put them in somewhere. So it, it, it made for a long book, I'm afraid. But you have the advantage with the U.S. printing, I should say, because the, the paper is just slightly thinner, so the whole book <laughs> is, is, is not quite so big, and it doesn't weigh quite so much. And the, and the paper's better quality, so the, the pictures and the, and the printing looks better, too. Great. So let's talk a little bit about physics. Um, in string theory, the particles in the universe are generated by the vibration of loops of constructs known as strings. The mathematical framework for describing these loops require multiple dimensions, and one variation requires up to 26, while the conventional model relies on 10. Um, in your twister theory, you can do away with all these extra dimensions. Can you explain that a little bit, perhaps? Yes. Let me just backtrack a little bit that, as you say, the, the way string theory works seems to require all these extra dimensions. And uh, this comes from certainly certain consistency requirements about how strings should should uh, should behave and so on. Now, twister theory is something quite different. It's an approach to understanding how space space time and quantum mechanics might fit together in some way. But the basic idea in twister theory is not to add extra dimensions. In fact, it's very crucially only three space dimensions and one time dimension. It's the number of dimensions we experience. But instead of adding extra dimensions, it's a reformulation of the space time as we understand it. So instead of thinking of points as being the fundamental entities, which is what you usually do when you think of space, space-time or events, points, instantaneous points, you think of entire light rays. It's not quite that. Entire light rays, you see, if you made a space each of whose points represented an entire light ray, you'd find that that space had five dimensions. Now, one of the basic driving forces behind twister theory is to find a theory which is based fundamentally on complex numbers. Now, you see, complex numbers, where you involve the square root of minus one into ordinary real numbers, they've been very useful in mathematics for many, many centuries. Only in the 20th century did they start to find a fundamental role to play in physics namely in quantum mechanics. So suddenly you find these wonderful numbers that work so well in mathematics but didn't seem to have any role to play in the physical world. Suddenly they did have a role to play in the physical world. Well, twister theory is trying to take that one step further. So you look for a role for these complex numbers, complex spaces, and so on, to have a role in 
in space-time geometry. And what you find is that if you look at light rays instead of points, you find almost, and I'll qualify this almost in a minute, or explain it in a minute, you find almost that the light, space of light rays is a, is a complex space. It can't quite be because the space of light rays is five-dimensional and any complex space has to be an even number of dimensions because each dimension counts as two dimensions, see the real and the imaginary parts. So where is the extra dimension? Well, what you find is that if you don't just think of light rays as, as sort of a path, a path of a single point, but you think of it as something spread out which has a, a spin. So it's in, that, in actual fact, li ordinary photons do have a spin. They have, kind of have a notion of helicity, so they spin around their direction of motion, and they can spin one way or the other way, and they can also have a, a different energy. And what you, what you find is if you incorporate these ideas into your photon, that you get another dimension, and you therefore get six dimensions, and miraculously, this six-dimensional space is a complex space. So the idea of Twister's theory is to take that complex space and you try to work with that. Now you see it's completely equivalent to the space-time description. You can use one or you can use the other, so you say why, what's it, why does it matter? But you're sort of driven in different directions. If you take Twister space as the basic geometry, then you find it's naturally complex and you do things which are naturally complex and it drives you in a certain direction. And that's, the, that's basically what Twister theory is about. Basically, it's a, it's a reformulation of geometry in a way which is more compatible with quantum mechanics. As it stands, it doesn't change any physics. It's just a, a different way of representing it. But I should say that there's a, there's a bit of an irony in this, that in the book I make the point that here we've got string theory and here we've got twister theory, and we don't know if either of them is a right approach to nature. But they can't both be, because they are incompatible in the sense of having different number of space dimensions. Well, the irony is that uh, just a bit over a year ago, Edward Witten, who is the sort of one of the prime, I mean, he is the sort of prime mover in modern string theory. He, yes, at Princeton, that's right. And he's, he's introduced many very ingenious notions which have pushed string theory forward in, in many ways. And he wrote a paper which appeared on, on the web in December in 2003 uh, in which he combines the ideas of string theory and twister theory. So the idea is basically you don't put your strings in these extra dimensions, that, that's what, you, what people have been doing up to this point. You put them in twister space. And twister space is already there, you see. You d it doesn't need any more spatial dimensions. In fact, you shouldn't have any more spatial dimensions. It's already there. And you can put the strings in that space. And then what he also finds is that this enables you to um, much more easily obtain sort of formulae which describe gluon scattering. So this is to do with high energy physics, uh, uh, strong interactions, and things which are actually measured in accelerators. So this is actually giving you results, I and mean, this is quite new in string theory, if you like, results which are physically measurable, phys physically observable. So I find this development a very exciting one, and I, fortunately in the book I did <laughs> manage to, to uh, catch this before uh, you know, it, so I do mention these ideas, not in any detail because that you know it was only just at the last minute. Uh, I'm just curious here. Could you also explain the essence of gauge theory? Well, gauge theories, of course, uh, gauge theories are very fundamental to our understanding of physical forces these days. But they also depend on a mathematical idea, which has been around for longer than gauge theory has. Well, actually, I'm not sure about that, because Hermann Weyl, who introduced the idea of gauge theory, um, maybe the, uh, that came before the ideas of bundles. But th the idea of a, of a fiber bundle and a, and a connection on a fiber bundle is basically what gauge theories use. And so I do describe this in the book. There's a chapter on, on these things. Um, still in the mathematical part, so that you're just doing mathematics at that stage. But let me try and describe, let me describe Weil's original idea, because I think that that gives you, it's the best way of, of phrasing it so that you can understand what's going on. See, Einstein introduced general relativity, or even before that, think of special relativity, and there's a thing called the clock paradox, or the twin paradox. It's not really a paradox, but it's if you have these two um, people, one who stays still on the Earth and the other one goes in a rocket ship to a distant star and comes back again, and you find that uh, the one who's gone off and comes back has experienced less time than the one back on the Earth. But what you don't find is that their clocks run at a different rate. You see, the one who's gone off and come back again, he brings his clock and it looks it's slow, you see. Right. Time hasn't moved forward by as much. But it still ticks at the same rate as your clock does. But in Weyl's theory, 
which he introduced as a generalization of Einstein's theory. The idea was that you could incorporate electromagnetism as well as gravity. And Weyl's idea was to say, well, why not generalize general relativity? So instead of having clocks with the clock paradox, which, you know, it can be slow, but it's not running slow. Let's suppose it might run slow. So that, in fact, if you go different routes through space to the, come back to the same point, you compare clocks and you find one of them is actually running at a different rate from the other one. And if you introduce that idea, you can and get a formalism which incorporates equations just like Maxwell's equations and Weyl's idea was this is a unified field theory which includes electromagnetism. Well, there's a minus and a plus to this. The minus was really Einstein pointed out that this can't be right. And we know that uh, this would mean particles would, would um, have different masses depending on what routes they take and, and it's really incompatible with the facts. So that was a bit of a disappointment to, to Weyl. But uh, the, the upside of all this was that a little while later, when the ideas of quantum mechanics came in, Weil and other people changed their view as to what this theory was, that the, it wasn't a change in clock rates, if you like, or in the scale of the metric, which comes to the same thing, but it was a change in the phase of the quantum mechanical phase. So you have a, not a real number, which would be a stretching, you know, the time rate could be stretched or squashed that would be a real parameter, but it's a complex parameter, which is a phase, so it's, you're going around the unit circle, you're multiplying by e to the i theta, or something like this. And with this idea, you could incorporate mag electromagnetism in a way which was consistent. And in fact, that's the way it's done now. This idea of vials is, that's the first gauge theory. It was a way of representing Maxwell equations and how the electric fields, electromagnetic fields, interact with particles in quantum mechanics, and it's exactly the way we do it. Now, that's the first gauge theory. Uh, it's called a gauge theory because the original vial idea was a gauge. You see, it was a change of, of scale. But then it became a complex change, and it's not so appropriate, really, to call it a gauge, but it's the same idea. But then this idea was generalized by Pauli and then by, uh, I think, Shaw, and then Yang and Mills independently, a little bit later, but they were the ones who really developed the theory and people picked up on it. So this is an idea called, called Yang-Mills theory. And it's found that this idea in a somewhat more general form than Weyl had, which was just this phase, but you have a, a group which is bigger than that. It's, it's, the, it's the basis of uh, forces according to modern particle physics. Both the weak interactions and the strong interactions are supposed to take place according to such a theory. In quantum theory, we are confronted with the paradox of Schrodinger's cat, uh, where the cat is characterized as being a superposition of dead or alive until it is observed. Now, I understand you've collaborated with Stephen Hawking, and he's known for saying, every time I hear about Schrodinger's cat, I reach for my gun. What does he mean there? Do you agree with him? Well, it's a pity he has to quote Hermann Goering on this. What, uh, I believe the quote was not original with Hermann Goering. It goes back before that. It's, uh, I, I don't much like that criticism. It's not really a criticism. It's, it's just a feeling he doesn't like the idea. But it's, it doesn't get you around the problem. I mean, Schrodinger pointed this problem out very clearly, and I think absolutely Schrodinger was absolutely right. He was saying, look, if you apply my equation, that's Schrodinger's equation, to something at the scale of a cat, you get this nonsense, which is a dead and alive cat at the same time. So he's more or less saying that. And he was saying, look, you shouldn't be using my equation, <laughs> Schrodinger's equation, to describe a thing like a cat. Something else basically has to come in. Now, he didn't make any suggestions to what that might mean, but... But uh, I think he's right. And uh, although all sorts of points of view are developed to try and accommodate Schrodinger's cat one way or the other, well, the main two are, are that somehow environmental decoherence is called. Somehow the, the state gets so complicated and mixed up with the environment that you, you have to change your procedures. None of these things really work if you follow them through. Um, the second one is, is what's called many worlds interpretation. You say, okay, the cat is there in these two superposed states, and if somebody comes along and looks at it, then that person now is has two superposed versions of them, one seeing the live cat, one seeing the dead cat, and they're in superposition too. And then the argument is somehow that there's a bit of a, you have to be a bit generous about the <laughs> point of view here, that uh, somehow your conscious perceptions must perceive either the alive cat or the de dead cat. And it's not really explained why, because I mean, what you, according to Schrodinger's equation, you ought to be perceiving them both at the same time. And that's, that's not what we actually perceive. So it's where you're driven if you don't believe there should be a change in quantum mechanics. 
You're driven to this many worlds view. But it doesn't get you out of the problem. You're driven there, but you still have the problem. So what I'm saying is, why don't we think about changing Schrodinger's equation at some level when masses become too big, in a sense, and in, at the level where you might have to worry about Einstein's general relativity. So that's my own view, and that there will be a change in the structure of quantum mechanics at that level. Another way of saying this is it's a question of what's quantum gravity. You see, most people think quantum gravity means you apply standard quantum theory to the structure of space-time. And this means you'll have to do something different about space-time structure. Okay, I don't have any qualms or quarrels with that. But what I worry about is why standard quantum mechanics... Now, of course, I can see why people, when they do quantum gravity, why they don't change quantum mechanics. Because if you change that, you're pretty well, well... You've changed everything, so what do you do, you see? So I can see that it doesn't tell you where to go. Nevertheless, it might be what nature is doing. And I think there are good reasons to believe that that is what nature is doing, that there are changes in the structure of quantum mechanics at that level. And there, there are several different independent reasons for believing this that, that are described in this book. So the, a lot of the book, a major part of the book, I would say, is devoted to this issue in different aspects. So it's spread over several chapters. Uh, so Steve Wolfram is famously known for developing Mathematica, and he's also a pioneer of cellular automata, which lets you create complex patterns from simple algorithms. Um, do you see any promise or insight using these methodologies? Well, I think these are interesting ideas, and he certainly develops them uh, to quite a considerable degree. But I don't myself believe there's any evidence that these ideas are playing a big role in, in physics. So certainly none of the standard physical theories can be thought of as, as cellular automata in any clear sense. Looking back, what's your most cherished epiphany? You mean what the thing that I'm pr most proud of? And <laughs> well, I think it has to be twister theory. Um, I mean, it, it may not be the thing that most people know about that I've done. I mean, maybe the non-periodic tilings or something. But no, but twister theory uh, is the thing that I would like to be remembered for most, I suppose, if that's... <laughs> so what are your thoughts about Kant and Hegel? Uh, Hegel describes a very different role to reality, history as a dialectical series of events. Um, you end the preface in your new book with a wonderfully wry statement about the need to study the forces that really shaped the world. Uh, can you share us your thoughts about the human experience beyond physics? Well, I don't know that I can comment on, on uh, Kant or Hegel because I'm, I'm no real philosopher uh, in the sense of knowing what these people uh, have said in any detail. So let me not comment on that too much. But I suppose I do think that, uh, you see, this this book is, is about physics and it's about physics and its relationship with mathematics. So it's about physics and mathematics and the how they seem to be intimately related and to what extent can you um, explore this relationship and trust it. Just in the, at the end of the book, I do mention what you can regard as the sort of other platonic absolutes. So what, if you like, what I've been concerned with is the platonic absolute of truth in its particular form, that is mathematical truth, which is a sort of very idealized form of truth. But I think it's a serious issue to wonder about the other platonic absolutes of, of say, beauty and, and, and morality. I don't think the case for them is as clear as it is for truth. But on the other, case, uh, other hand, there does seem to be some connection between beauty and and the search for these laws that govern the world and that you, s you certainly find that people are driven uh, with this beauty as a sort of criterion or a, a guide to discovery in this context. And as for morality, well that's all tied up with the question of consciousness. If you didn't have any conscious beings in the world, there wouldn't really be any morality. But, but with consciousness that you have that. So I think that the issue of how consciousness relates to the physical world is all tied up with morality but we have a lot to learn on that one. Finally, on a lighter note, let's talk about pop culture. Reality and existence are recurring themes in movies and books. Questions including who are we, uh, what is real. Are you, are you amused by how these are treated in, say, for example, movies like The Matrix? I didn't actually see The Matrix, but I get, I've seen other, other movies where maybe similar sorts of themes. I mean, I find it amusing and entertaining, and I've, I've always been a, a fan of science fiction. I used to read it a lot when I was younger, uh, and I like science fiction movies. But I think they're useful for giving us ideas, and I think that's true. I think science fiction is, is very good at giving ideas. But on the other hand, you have to take it all with a suitable amount of salt. And <laughs> these, I certainly don't believe that uh, these things like, you know, a Terminator or something coming from the future, and who's who's a mechanical entity, uh, or a, but I think it's uh, they raise issues often too, which which are not trivial issues. So yeah, I, I enjoy them. <laughs> uh, Professor Penrose, thanks for joining us on Berkeley Rocks. Uh, thanks for your time. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much too.
that in terms which are a bit more technical than the accounts that you normally get in, in popular books. So uh, it was an attempt to describe things at a deeper level than you, than you can usually get access to without, you know, that going to the full thing and reading a textbook. I should I- perhaps explain the origin of the book, which might be of some interest to people. Some years ago, I wrote a book called The Emperor's New Mind, and that book, as it's understood today, well, anyway, th- this book was written, and various people commented to me. They said, well, you know, I could perhaps use this book for a course, Physics for Poets, or whatever it is, if it didn't have all that contentious stuff about the mind in it. So I thought, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound too hard. All I do is I get my scissors out and snip out all the bits which have any- something to do with the mind. And the trouble is that uh, if I did that, and I didn't actually do it, but... Hello, it's a great pleasure. Pleasure to be back in, in Berkeley area. You've written a very engaging and insightful book, The Road to Reality, A Complete Guide to the Laws of the Universe. Could you tell us a little bit about it and what motivated you in writing it? Yes, well, the book is uh, meant to describe what's going on in basic physics today and what led up to was describing the point of view which I had about consciousness and why it was not something that comes about from complicated calculations. So we're not exactly computers, something else going on, and the question of what this something else was would depend on some detailed physics, was the idea. And so I needed to have chapters in that book which describes the physics as I sort of imagined doing it. The whole book fell to pieces, really, because the whole driving force behind the book was uh, this quest to find out, you know, what could it be that constitutes consciousness in in the physical world as we know it or as we might hope to know it in the future. But um, (coughs) without that driving force, the book sort of didn't hang together, really. So I had to think of some other basis for this. See, initially,